Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening everyone. Okay. So we are on to our next session, uh, session number two for the evening. It's a uh, title Innovation Towards Unity. So do the social innovation uh, to promote social, uh, not just social cohesion, but to, towards social unity um, would be challenging, I think, for our times since there are technologies that are available to us today that were not available before. Uh, information today spread too fast, in fact, sometimes, but that's not the fault with the technology, it's, the f it's on how we use it. So today, I am glad to introduce the four speakers for this session. To my left is Ms. Hana Shazwin Azizan. Uh, she is a former member of the Global Movement of uh, Moderates Foundation. And uh, you, are, you are in the, uh, your, your area of interest is in, in, in the cross section of technology and crime. Right. And um, next to Hana is Mr. Adli Zakwan from the Globe. Uh, from Muslim, uh, yeah, Gabungan, uh, sorry, Angkatan Belia, Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia, ABIM. Okay, and um, our next to Mr. Adli is Andrew, all right, Andrew Han. Uh, he's a social activist and also a documentary filmmaker. Okay, you're, okay. And also, uh, last but not least, is Mr. Ryan Ong who is a Gender Studies and Communication student at Monash University, Malaysia. Uh, each of the speakers here today have accomplished feats uh, that work towards racial harmony and social unity. And uh, without further ado, I would like to start off the session with Ms. Hana. Yes, thank you. Okay, fair enough. I can do that. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Hana, and uh, the area of my research actually doesn't fall into racial discrimination, but actually more into Islamic extremism. And uh, I previously actually did a lot of work regarding Daesh, ISIS. I've worked with some of uh, the uh, Australian and American embassies on these topics. So uh, that is what I will be talking about because I think if you read in the concept paper in the beginning of your program, it talks about extremism, the actions of extremism. Uh, and I am an academic, not an activist. So I've done some research on this. And I've also brought some new research here today, which I've tried to make simple and uh, easy to understand. And there are new considerations for what we traditionally associate in CVE, countering violent extremism. We have preconceived notions of what it means to be an extremist and how people become extremists. So a little bit not in the racial discrimination side, but there actually are a lot of overlapping areas that I think uh, even people in the uh, arena of racial discrimination can take a little bit of um, uh, hikmah from, so to speak. Okay, so why should we counter extremism? Uh, some basic facts about Islamic extremism. We have 12% of Malaysian Muslims who have a favorable opinion of Daesh. Favorable, not so-so, uh, but actually are somewhat positive. So that's quite a, a, a significant number. And then a more popular number is 39% have soft support for these extremists. And these are all Pew Global Attitude Surveys from 2013 and 2015. And then in general terms, um, we also have some economic impact. Terrorism doesn't significantly impact our GDP, uh, but it does range from region to region. But of course, this isn't, these aren't really the things that viscerally shake us as Malaysians. It would be this. So the fact that we have very active support here in Malaysia and that attacks actually have been launched, people have been arrested and there have been cells in the country. 
So uh, this is really why we should counter extremism. It's because we are scared that we have extremists in the country. So we do have existing government policies. Uh, they're contentious. I think I've listed some of the key points that people have problems with, right? So you've got POTA, you've got the National Security Act, and, now, and the government announced the formation of a counter messaging center. But I'd argue that these are all things that address symptoms rather than the actual problems which is what this conference is about. But it's such a broad problem that you can't really just put in solutions and expect everything to go away. So, you know, I, I want to take these two because uh, we, we in Singapore have some shared policies. In a nutshell, you have the sort of Lee Kuan Yew generation, Mahade generation, where they're talking about you have to move hard on terrorists or it will basically turn our country into, like, it will blow our country up, essentially. Like, he, these are his actually words. And then on POTA, uh, the Prime Minister, Najib Razak himself, said that prevention is better than cure. But the policies that he has introduced are more about treating symptoms rather than prevent, uh, preventation, prevention. Sorry. Right. So now let me talk about the key determinants for radicalization. It's not ideology because you'll find that most people who become radicalized are not actually very religious. Uh, research by Manny Crone has shown that it's violence that predisposes someone to radicalization and extremism. And there's lots of different types of violence. And what radicalization and violent extremism is, is the transference of one type of violence to another. So how can there be different types of violence, right? You've got verbal violence, physical violence, familial violence, societal violence, ideological, racial, of course, religious violence too. There's lots of microaggression in society. You can say small things that are really insidious. You know, it doesn't outright like menindas a person, but these are small things that accumulate and they are a form of violence. And then of course you have lots of people who are just plain attracted to violence, you know. Uh, Lots of people who go to Syria or who uh, are attracted to this sort of ideology simply want to look cool and glamorous and hold a gun. I mean, that is just a fact. A higher cause is not necessary. Often, people who become radicalized want to be near violence and so they decide to find a means of justifying it. And of course, politicization. There is no such thing as a, an extremist who is not politicized. No one has ever turned into an extremist as a lone wolf. They're socialized into it. So it's either because of the people that they talk to or the literature that they read. It's not a vacuum. So with, at least with Daesh, right, it's a religious political sort of angle. So you use the religion to justify your political means. And that sort of ties in together with feelings of, of alienation. And feelings of alienation don't have to be real. You just have to imagine that you're alienated. So for example, um, this is, will tie into an example that I have on some Malaysians who have actually joined Daesh. And the idea is that you can be really comfortable living at home, but you know you don't have a higher purpose, and, and you feel like other people have it better. That's an imagined feeling of alienation, even if you have a job, a supportive family, and a roof over your head. And when people have these like, imagined feelings of alienation, they may look for the higher purpose through politicization. And of course, you have the exposure and normalization of violence in your society. And this is basically the recipe for someone who becomes radicalized. So, if I can make sure that none of you have fallen asleep so far. So, this is my poll question. I just like a raise of hands, right? How many of you think that for parents to counter peer influence, you have to spend more time with them? Just spending time only. Hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven people. Thank you. How about communication? Is communication the most important thing? Hands up. One, okay, like once la, okay la. One, two, three, four, five, oh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. All right. And finally, emotional closeness or attachment to your parent. How many of you think that is the most important one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Okay, that's great. So communication is actually the highest. Most of you think that to counter peer influence, you must have lots of good communication with your child. The answer is time spent. <laughs> Congratulations, you win nothing but the knowledge that you've made the right decision. So studies have actually shown um, in actually a study on peer influence in delinquency that communication and emotional closeness has zero effect on peer influence once you have already made that connection with that other person, like a recruiter or a bad egg or a criminal. Once their child has actually made that connection with them, you can be super close to them, you can have lots of communication, but it means absolutely nothing in terms of how your child will act. So this is actually the reason why you have so many stories of the mothers of Daesh recruiters going, but I'm so close to my son, he's so well behaved, you know, he talks to me every day, he calls me on the phone, I don't understand why he went into ISIS. And the reason is because you don't spend enough time with your child. But actually, it's not so much you don't spend time with your child because, you know, time spent is more important than emotional closeness. It's actually because if you spend more time with your kid, your kid is actually less likely to do something else because you're occupying his or her time. But let me just say also that if you are emotionally close to your child and also communicate more with them, early on, they are less likely to, bef to befriend negative elements and influences. So, once they have already made that friend, you're in trouble. Lah. But yeah, peers are also more likely to change behavior. And the next study I'm going to show you is this. This is a slightly complicated chart to look at, but it basically shows you that when uh, a group of uh, teenagers were interviewed, like who has more empathy for you, who cares about your day, who listens to your problems, nearly all of the time it's the best friend, right? But parents have more influence. You know, you go to your parent for advice. Now, the question is though, when you know you're going to get scolded by your parent for something that you did or something that you're interested in, you're not going to go to your parent. You're going to go to your friend. And so something interesting with this cross-section of time spent as well as, uh, you know, empathy, caring. Well, people online, like recruiters, uh, people who want to socialize you into extremism, occupy this role of friend. So you can be super close to your parent, you can communicate a lot, but as long as you have already made this person, met this person who, who occupies this role of friend, um, they are more likely to change your behavior. And in the same study, it shows that uh, friends are more likely to change your political views rather than your parents. So parents have a role in which they guide their child into what sort of political alignment they might be interested in. But nearly all of the time, in absolute terms, you are more likely to share the same politics as your friend and to be more liberal than your parents. So what that means to say is that, you know, your friend cares about you. You talk to your friend. You're emotionally close to your friend. You tell, you tell them everything, your problems, instead of your parents. And on top of which, you're more likely to be socialized into a political uh, view by your friend. And, I mean... So these are all, of course, the studies, but what we're talking about, this, the role of friend is then occupied by the person who recruits you. And finally, something else that, uh, you know, is something that parents don't necessarily have a grasp of is technology. So this is um, Fajar al-Bashar, uh, sorry, Fajar al-Bashar, which is the dawn of glad tidings. It is an app by ISIS. And it's been out since 2014. And what it does is actually gives their followers updates on what's happening in the Islamic State. Uh, and it also actually, once you sign up to it, uh, it posts on your social media accounts on their behalf. So, you know, you had this one day when there were 40,000 tweets just about um, the invasion of Mosul. And like um, estimates say that 65 to 75% of those tweets came through this app. So a bit difficult when you have a generation gap in terms of technology, you know? So you've got a friend who is more likely to influence your politics, your behavior, and also more likely to reach out to you in terms of um, extremism. So I want to focus on the peer, the friend, because we always talk about the parents, but there is a lot more to be said about the friend or the peer. So 
What have peers done in countering extremism? Not a lot is published freely, you know, for security purposes, but I can name you two real examples. Lah. The first one is catfishing. So catfishing is, uh, you know, if you go online and you see a really hot girl and you're like, hey girl, what's up? And then she shows you some pictures and she's like, hey, why don't you pass me some money and then we can go on a date. And so you send money her way and then poof, she disappears. That's catfishing. So what happened was, uh, I think three or four girls in Chechnya actually catfished ISIS. So fighters uh, often try to recruit young girls into becoming uh, brides of the Mujahideen. And they basically said, we're too poor, we have no money, send us some money. So they did, and the girls scammed them out of $3,000. Uh, so I can't, this is something that they've done, but I really can't recommend or encourage that the lay person does it. I just want to acknowledge that this is something that has happened, right? And then, of course, the second thing is a more generic catch-all is internet trolling, which some of my colleagues will appreciate. Um, so there's this group called Anonymous Online. I think most people know about them. They've done things that range from pranks to outright counter-terrorism activities. You know, Rick Rolling, which is essentially linking uh, a fake link to a video of a guy singing and dancing, just being horrible people online and arguing with Daesh supporters. Um, actually managing to sneak into like their Telegram and WhatsApp groups and doing anything else about post-porn. But real stuff that they've done is through social media, they've been able to look at the met metadata, uh, find out where they are actually located through geolocation, report that to authorities, and have, have, they have actually successfully bombed some terrorist encampments. So um, again, not stuff I would necessarily recommend to the layperson, but stuff that has been done. And I think the point I want to take away here is, if you consider yourself as like slightly the older generation or a parent, would you have thought of these things? Would you have thought of de defrauding ISIS by pretending to be a hot girl on the internet? I think no one would have anticipated that. So, um, to sum up, basically new considerations that should be included in countering violent extremism. Uh, the first one is, Violence in all forms and its normalization in society is a more likely precursor to radicalization. So what that means is, first we have to recognize that there is violence in society. Again, not just in the physical sense, but also in the words that we use, the policies that we have, the way that we have social practices. There is violence in it that maybe we don't know or don't realize because it's so normal and pervasive. So once we recognize that, we can then move on the road of trying to make it abnormal again. We have to be not okay with violence against other people as well as against ourselves. Second, of course, is we have to stop thinking of teenagers and the youth as just, you know, uh, someone to just sort of engage because they're there. Because they're sort of really, really the core component uh, in terms of influences politically, religiously, and behaviorally. So there's a lot of study in behavioral economics on how uh, young people especially play a larger role in changing the behavior of their peers. So peer pressure is a real thing, and if you can actually make it positive peer pressure, then you know, that is something to be considered. And finally, Peers are more attuned with the environment, real and digital, that for men support and for and recruitment into violent extremism. So instead of you know, um, going high level, trying to do the research, sometimes it's just worth to go to a young person who's super anti-ISIS or anti-racism and ask them, yeah, so what are you experienced? Have you done anything about it? And sometimes they say, yes, I have. And so when they say, yes, I have, you say, oh, cool, let me know so that I can do it too. Because unfortunately, in this field, uh, being able to record your research and your findings is very, very difficult. So sometimes it's not one size fits all, you have to try everything out. So that would be my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, I would like to allow for one or two questions for clarifications for Hannah. Maybe there are some things in the slide that you would like to ask for further clarifications or anything. Is there anything? All right. If nothing, then we can move on to the second uh, speaker. But before that, I would like to rec uh, summarize a bit what uh, Hannah has just mentioned, is to recognize violent and non-violent extremism and to treat the youth as 
they are shapers, not as recipients of our whatever it is that we tell them, but they shape our social policies and ask the youth what they're doing rather than <laughs> going all around and not knowing what to do. Okay, so uh, next uh, we have Mr. Adli. Where's my book? We have uh, Mr. Adli Zakwan. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening to everyone. Thank you for the invite. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I'm interested to be part of this. Uh, one thing that is not mentioned in my bio is that I'm also the uh, <clears throat> working on the Countering, countering Violent Extremism Task Force uh, by ABIM. But apart from that, also, of course, working under the agenda of international issues and also uh, unity or peaceful coexistence of which where uh, the reason why I'm standing here today, because when it comes to countering or in, when it comes to violent extremism, there's, uh, according to Prof. Greg Barton from University of Dick, Dick University of Australia, there are three stages of, of uh, violence and, and, uh, and radicalization of which that the primary one is, of course, when you talk about extremism, it started out from racism, prejudice and everything. But the second part of those who are already sympathized to ISIS or Daesh, yeah, so these are the second part of the intervention that's required. And the third part is for those who already went to Syria and you know, radicalized and become extremists. So that's where, as you can see, all these three interventions all start from the beginning, which is when we talk about racism or violence uh, of, of ideology. So that's where, we, that's, that's where I will start uh, the discussion today. Yep. <clears throat> so this is my outline, nothing much. I will, inform, I will tell you about the platforms that we have, programs, challenges, future prospects, and conclusion. So what is ABIM? ABIM, according to jo, uh, Professor John L. Esposito in the Oxford Dictionary of Islam, so we are basically the uh, Muslim youth organization that has been established since the 1970s. And then we are so-called, you know, in this, in this dictionary it's called that we are responsible of bringing in the idea of Islamization of Malaysia. And then maybe you can see it good or bad, uh, you know, some question with it. We are, you know, we are the, we are the reason of causing the idea of violent extremism. But of course, I will not. I will reject that uh, you know, truthfully and wholefully because what we are doing now, one of the concepts of Habim is Wasatiya, which is moderation, has been practiced all years along. And we already, we came, uh, this year is our 45th year of anniversary of Habim. And last weekend, we just had our annual general meeting, of which one of the discussion we have is on the idea of extremism and, of course, the establishment of Bangsa Malaysia, and of which I will present you a book that we just wrote uh, recently. So this is basically the background of Malaysia and the numbers and here and there. So our context, of course, uh, plural with, plurality within the framework of unity. And then plural or pluralism is quite a hard or strong word to use in Malaysia. So we prefer to use the word of diversity. Uh, and for being an Islamic organization, uh, it's quite important for us to do something about racism. Because why? I would like to show this poll by Medeca Center and what we shared with ideas. Uh, uh, one side for one giant and Ben, Ben Sofian, of it that shows that Malay look at themselves as Muslims first uh, rather than calling themselves as Malay or Malaysian, compared to the Chinese and Indian, of which they call themselves Malaysian first rather than their own religion or ethnicity. Of which that I want to ask you, do you think this is problematic for Malay to think themselves as Muslims first? How many of you think that this is a problem rather than calling themselves as Malaysian? Be honest to yourself, you can share your thoughts. How many of you think it's, it will be problematic? One, two, three, four, okay, quite a number. So this is actually coming back to the question that we need to ask as well. Why can't, uh, how do they, they understand Islam? So if they understand Islam, which is takfiri or mengkafirkan, and that is problematic. If they understand Islam is something about authority, about power, then that will be a difficult part. But for us in Abim, for being an Islamic organization, Islam itself is not about power, it's not about authority. But it's rather empowering kind of religion. When we talk about Islam, you have to differentiate between Islam and Islamism, for example, of which that we have few political parties that is focusing on that. When we talk about jihad, there's also a group called jihadism. Yep. So jihad and jihadism are two separate things. Jihad is the ideology. Jihad is the idea of which you strive yourself to be become better. You make a huge difference to yourself, to your parents. That is jihad. But when it comes to jihadism, of which that now the terms have been misused, or even Hana used Islamic extremism, to a certain extent, because Islam itself has been hijacked by this kind of terminology. But we see this rather than as a threat, we see this as a opportunity. So when there's a Malay, Malay, or you know, Malay came to us and saying that I'm a Muslim first, that's good. 
Because why? Because if you are saying yourself that you are a Malaysian or you are Muslims, then that requires to, yeah, you have this responsibility of becoming a better Malaysian. So if you think that you are Muslims, then you have to be a better Malay and better Malaysians of which accept other religion and other ethnicity. And this is the fact. These are the things that they need to understand. Because why? We look at this interpretation of Surah Al-Hujurat number 13. Verse 49, uh, 49 verse uh, ayat number 13, are we saying that why do God created different tribes, man and woman, a lot of races, a lot of religion? Why? And God answers by saying that it's for that you may know each other. So there's a question. I mean, in the end, I will show you the one of the problems that we face as Islamic organization with this labeling. People call us as liberal. The interpretation that we have as liberal is plural. But to the extent you need to understand Islam, and I'm not talking about Islamism, I'm talking about Islam, is plural and liberal. If you look at this interpretation, for example, yeah, if you're looking at, this is where it lays down of the existence of other races and religion. It shows that God created us to be different and for us to know each other. And if you look at the verses of the Quran, for example, Lakum di nukum in the Surah Al-Kafirun, the Surah of the Disbelievers. So this Surah concerned about the non-believers or the non-Muslims. But it doesn't talk about rejection in that surah, but rather it's like about accepting the existence of other religion. And it's mentioned twice in the surah itself, saying that you will not convert to my religion. I will, I will not, uh, I will not uh, pray to your, uh, to your. I mean, I will not. Ex How to say this in the? Masanya, nakum di nakum lady. That's the end. So basically, your religion is your religion, and my religion is my religion. I will not convert to your religion. You will not convert to my religion. So we know each other. So it's not. In this surah, it's not talking about tolerance, but rather the accepting. You know, you are, you have your religion, okay? That's your religion, and this is my religion. And again, in the uh, in the Quran, it says, "Like, um, uh, like, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot." But then, like, uh, the most famous word, and I've highly criticized and debate and everything. There's no compulsion in religion, and again, this is how liberal Islam is. You know, but this, of course, when it comes to the public or people on the ground, because we have this one mainstream of understanding of Islam. So for us to come out and say, you know, Islam is this, Islam is that, it's quite hard. So now it is in the era of huge data, of information, there's a higher degree of knowledge that we need to understand. That's one which is information. One, and information doesn't mean that it's a knowledge, you know, there's a second degree. And the higher degree of knowledge is wisdom. This is where we find it's hard for us to explain because in order for you to make people understand, rather than showing them with the information and knowledge, you need wisdom as well. And wisdom requires experience and you know exposures and openness towards things. And then from this word, we can derive there's four ukhwa. If you're familiar with ukhwa, if you're familiar with Darul Islam, there's another thing about uh, Ikhwanul Muslimin, you know, the brotherhood, we are the Muslim brotherhood. But actually, in Islam, and even in classical writings, there's a lot of terms of who have been used, as for example, what is written in, the, in front of you. It's not just Islamic brotherhood, but rather community brotherhood, you and your community, and nationality brotherhood, and humanity brotherhood, which is the bigger, bigger concept of Islam. There's this one surah that is compulsory for us to recite when we pray, which is the surah al Fatiha. Fatiha means the open of the Quran. And the first word used is Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen And there it says the word of Rabbil Alameen The God of the universe Rather than the God of the Muslims and the, Again this shows how universal Islam is And this is the approach I want to say When there's this one guy telling you That this is Darul Harbi, Darul Islam This is Kafir Harbi and you are Muslim And this is with all these issues You have to understand that it's not written in the Quran But rather a classical uh, writings that has been used by certain quarters just try to make sure that you are being divided and, uh, and, and misunderstand about the religion itself. So this is the approach that we are taking. Of course, in the Quran, the most favored uh, okay, we had, we called, I mean, this is my, our seniors in Abim, we call uh, Al-Amin Mazru'i uh, to come to KL and talk about diversity and everything. This is the question that he asked. Was it part of God's grand design that the history of the Malay people has included a naturalist face, a Buddhist face, a Hindu face, a finally a Muslim face? Was this multi-religious evolution of the Malay people intended to be a preparation for future multicultural leadership? So, so this is the kind of understanding we need to have. Why God, I mean, again, on the basis that Malay look themselves Muslims, so we, us as a Muslim organization, Islamic youth organization, we are giving them this kind of argument and we are giving them this kind of approach. So, that if, so again, to justify saying that if you call yourself as Muslims, 
And this is Islam that I'm talking about. So you as a Muslim has to understand this kind of concept. And we, this is nothing new. Of course, some of us, when we... Uh, I'm sorry to quote uh, Siti Kasim. <laughs> because she, she said, uh, is this new Abim? No, it's not new Abim. <laughs> this, is not, this is the same old Abim in, you know, in 1970, even though you have some reservation on Anwar Ibrahim, but in his uh, presidential address has been coming until, until these years. In 1978, it concerns about that, you know, we are, even in this stage, we are in this first stage of Islamization. So the Islamization that we're trying to bring is not just for Muslims to pray, but to try to understand that Islam is actually a solution for all these uh, problems that we are facing right now. And as a Muslim, we have to work for it as, for example, penyelesaian kepada masalah masyarakat majmuk. By saying that Islam regards discrimination as a criminal act because it is contradictory to the Islamic call to unite different communities and to encourage tolerance, friendship and mutual respect among all human beings. And we just added, like I said, mentioned you earlier, we're just coming for our 45th years of anniversary of Abim, and there's this call uh, mentioned by Muhammad Rami in his ucapan dasar presidential address. By saying that, I'm so sorry, it's simile, but then I hope you can understand. Uh, agenda pembinaan bangsa Malaysia yang didasari oleh semangat persaudaraan tanah air dan ukhwah isa insaniyah. Insan means people, mankind. Um, sekaligus bebas dari chauvinism, racism, kecurigaan dan kejubahan sosial memang sulit dan berliku. Namun kita tidak punya pilihan selain mengambil jalan kepelopuran yang sememangnya menjadi watak dan jati diri gerakan ini. Jadi jika bukan kita, siapa lagi? This is the question we need to ask. When we talk about racism, we comment, we being reactionist, we being condemning Jakim for this, we condemning this country for that. But how much that we actually contributed in creating unity. We are being reactive rather than being proactive. You know, we are being responding to watch so lot of allegation, but then us ourselves, we haven't actually worked, really, really work for unity. We haven't actually, we rarely spoke to our friends saying that it's important for us to work for unity. Of course, we are against discrimination, against racism, but we don't work for unity. That's the one of the things. So, jika bukan kita, siapa lagi since we are in this room? And this is the word that's most beautiful that been, we have been taken by our approach uh, in these recent years, which is وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا كَإِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِعَلَمِينَ So Islam here arrived not to normalize things, but rather as a rahmah to the, uh, to the human being, to the uh, mercy to all mankind. And mercy means that, for example, if you come into this room, this room is perfect, beauty, you know, it's okay. So when you left the room, it's the same as the same as it is. But when it comes to Islam, the metaphor is that when you left the room, this place become better. So that's the rahmah. That's the rahmah they want to, they, they want to mention. So Islam is not there to change things, and, but to make things more beautiful, to make things that's well accepted and, you know, uh, that, uh, and, and against the rahmah to all mankind. It's not about uh, alamin, uh, uh, muslimin, uh, Malay, but it's all mankind. So this is the kind of project we need to take. Okay. This is the approaches. Uh, this is the platform that we have, a more subtle language that we use, five minutes in, uh, to go. So we have Islamic outreach uh, of Abim, and, and this, uh, we organize Masjid Tour Guide Program. So of course, we have it at Masjid Negara, Masjid Putrajaya, one of the places that you can go. And this is where we explain not only about the mosque, but also about Islam. And then of course, there's no, <laughs> there's no compulsion in religion. We just here there to explain if people want to know more about fasting, about religion, and everything. So the second platform is one of the beautiful platform that we have, which is called Friendship Group of Interface Services. So we are one of the, those who are creating this, uh, or established this organization, besides Buddhist Mahavivara, Council of Churches, Malaysia Hindu Sangha, Malaysia Gurdwaras, Sai Baba, they're all there, because we're talking about faith. We're not talking about, sometimes in Malaysia, you have to understand there's differences between faith and religion, but there's also faith. And the, the things that we do is we rarely talk much about religion, but rather than forcing ourselves to talk about unity. We don't say, talk much about our differences. Of course, by the time we actually understand each other, but then we are talking about, uh, yeah, we are, sorry, 15 years, we are talking about unity and how we can conduct programs. One of the programs that we did, uh, of course, is, I will share it later on. And then it's Habib, uh, in uh, MBM, Majlis Belia Malaysia, which consists of a lot of other multi-religious uh, kind of youth organization. Yep. Uh, Okay, so what ABI members also include in part of the uh, committee to promote interfaith understanding harmony JKM PKA. So this is where we provide the dasa, perbicara perbicara tentang dasa. So we have programs on the ground. We have those who are in the policy making. So this is how we want to bring it in. And then no picture. Okay, so this we have schools in Abim. So which that we are saying that not only programs that we do externally, but since we have school and people, you know how we love to critic, uh, criticize our own education system here and there, but for us, for being a private education, 
besides following the syllabus provided by the government and everything, we also have our own uh, privilege of sharing our own syllabus. And one of course, when you come to the issue of interfaith discussion, I think we have it there. As in, not directly, but it's extracurricular. Because why? Um, oh, there's so many things I want to share. I'm so sorry, but then I will just proceed. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, this is Divine Wing Project. The second time that we organized this, it's quite an, issue, quite an, a big issue last time as well because they, we are bringing in Muslims, non-Muslims. We are visiting a lot of other religious places, and you know, religious leader will explain about their religion and the place and everything. So we receive quite a good response uh, on this as well. And sport activities, we conduct a lot of sports, a mixture of Muslims, non-Muslim, Malay, non-Malay. We play against together, and again, you might find this or find this a bit corny or you know, sport activities. What can you do? But then you have to understand. Following up from this kind of sport activities, they already managed to have, uh, find their own team. They created their own team that they, they will fight with other groups. And then, uh, you know, this is a good environment because they will follow up. You know, good players know another good players and they just make a team and then proceed with it. So it's, it has to be organic at the same time as well. We don't want to tell you, okay, you have to unite, you know, but then it's organic while playing football is one of the ways that we can share it as well. And advocacy. So, uh, the advocacy that we have, of course, we try to go out of religion kind of discussion. We talk about Myanmar, about Arakanis, Rakhine, and also the, the Rohingya of Palestine, but it's more rather a humanitarian issue. So what we did is, of course, to include other non-religious, non-Islamic organizations and to be part of this as well. So FGI is also part of this, uh, supporting our struggle in helping the Rohingyas and, uh, and others. And then this is Majlis Berbuka Puasa. You know, we have our own Majlis Berbuka Puasa. Iftar Muhabba 2016 and this is the I have the video I project gonna share because of time limit. I'm so sorry, but I really want to go to this. But then again, you might see this corny, but it's a good chance for us to actually go forward because we had this in few universities at their Ta'aruf program or their I don't know introduction program. So this is where we have a lot of songs playing on and then uh, there will be more people go to that kind of orchestra and then with the hope or with the intention that this is, you know, create unity and volunteerism. So this is one of the biggest project or successful project we managed to conduct, of which that uh, when it comes to Banji Kat Kelantan, so FJS went there and the experience shared by uh, those who are from other groups as well by saying because Kelantanese, of course they have a lot of other uh, religion there, but then they rarely talk much about religion. But then here it's a different case because they see Christians wearing Christian attire and helping them building. Tanda and apa semua is kind of it's changed quite a lot of perception of which that we believe is about community discourse. Okay, roundtable discussion. It's quite important because from this roundtable discussion, we the one of the resolution we have is that it's important for us to have interface syllabus in public schools. And of course, if you follow the media, a lot of we are being criticised for it. But we are proceeding with it, but not in uh, public schools, but rather as co uh, extracurricular outside of schools. So we'll be uh, conducting. Uh, uh, workshop on understanding the values of religions. We're not talking about the differences or the religion itself, but the values, for example, about parents, honoring our parents. So there's a lot of other religions talking about honoring parents, and we find this as a good value. And we talk about uh, when it comes to uh, celebration, what comes kind of celebration and why. So these values are actually the same. So why do Muslims have to bury their, those who already you know, passed away? So there are quite a number of things that we found out actually quite the same to each other. And of course, Curtis Vid, this is a historic visit with Mufti Wilaya. We all thought that he might be not be so welcoming, but again, we thought wrong. I mean, he said that it's good and we are really supportive. We shows that positive thing will come to, you know, we we'll, we'll do good changes. And now he more open to this and, uh, okay, challenges, circle of influence. Uh, I want to share this. Okay, circle of influence because it's just now, of, even though we are doing it quite well on the ground, but again, it's only a same circle of group. We need to expand more. So the, how we want to do it? We have this pilot project doing uh, Pusat Perumah Rakyat. And then uh, I forgot to, besides uh, orchestra, we do have this theater, inter-religious theater as well. So what we're trying to do is this, there's this group called Revolution Stage. You can follow it in Twitter. Their concept is quite interesting, whereby they teach skills, acting skills for PPR, and they need to do their own theater and everything. So putting it in unity concept, we would like to do the same as well by giving them this, uh, this, these skills and everything and they themselves become a, their own committee will come on some, some, some sort of theatre and will perform by one event. And okay, narcissism and sarcasm, this is quite important for me to share. Because in social media, again for us, uh, people like to be sarcastic and you know, showing that they are better than others. But this is wrong. I mean, this will not help us to create, uh, to create a better society and everything because you need to understand 
in Hamka in Beli they say that if you kalau kamu ada banyak lebih banyak agama maksudnya kamu harus jadi bagai padi lagi banyak agama lagi menunduk tapi when they come to this you don't have any information knowledge about it but you say that you know much and then though this is not a good environment that we need to so again social innovation of course is important but then we have to understand the most important thing is interaction between each other in the Quran say lita arafu you have to know each other so again the innovation is not on how on, on the end but in how you want to create this kind of interaction and labeling pluralism liberalism who speak for islam i don't speak for islam but other than this is the discussion that we need to understand the openness for us to talk about our own religion minority against majority yep so those who are talking or inciting hatred 13 million i think it's just a small number of people we are the majority actually but we just need to realize again that then be reactive to be proactive and this is not happening in civil society organization it's also happened in other religious traditional uh, group as well whereby they have this new fiqh this new science of religion by saying that how can we understand the fiqh of the minority and how you want to accept so there's a lot of things going on in Malaysia and outside of Malaysia we just need to bring it on the ground and people to understand it this future prospect and uh, okay and why us kenapa kita kalau bukan siapa kenapa tidak to answer this question again I shared it earlier Elderman Barometer Trust 2016 which shows that uh, government only received 39% of people trust but NGOs receive 71% of the basis that NGOs do what is right. So now we are always complaining about the government here and there, but then you know people don't believe in the government actually. They believe in us, NGO. So it has to be bottom up. And I think that we do, no matter what, who do or whatever we want to do, it has to be on the ground. And that's why we are important. We are the one that need to prove the government. Even without the support of the government, we do in our own effort. We have our own platform, and we can make change. Yep. So yeah, I guess I said I'm so sorry to exit there. So I have two books that will share. And then, uh, one is Pembinaan Bangsa Kepelbagaan Dalam Bingkai Kesatuan, written by one of us. Another one is by Abin Press, which is called Hududism. Yep. So, it's quite interesting for you to understand more. So, we are not talking about Hudud, but we're talking about the movement of Hududism. So, do uh, approach me. I only bring 20 copies if you're interested to let me know and then I can give it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give it a hand to Mr. Adli Zakwan. I like how Abin rooted all their practical practices in ideology. I mean, he, Abim started with texts from the Quran and, and Hadith that, that call for racial unity and universality of uh, unity with people and translate that into a lot of action. I mean, they're doing a lot, like a lot. So, okay, uh, without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Andrew Han uh, uh, to give his presentation. Um, it says here that uh, Mr. Andrew is a documentary filmmaker, so I'm very interested to see the role of the media uh, in shaping what we see and view and internalize as racial unity. So give it a hand to Mr. Andrew. All right, hello. My name is Andrew. Uh, after the two presentations, I'm not sure how Project Football Riot will counter terrorism or extremism. <laughs> but I'll try our best. Maybe friendly match with ISIS or something. Right. Uh, I, I come here in representative of Wins, who is supposed to be here to give presentation, but uh, he extends his apology for not able to be here because he has to attend another matter in Philippines. Uh, today, I'd like to thank uh, Pusat Komas for the opportunity to come here to share with you guys uh, the the initiative uh, in Project Football right yet, and I hope uh, in this 15 minutes we can uh, inform you what, what are the things that we have done, and hopefully the things that we can collaborate to, uh, with each other. All right? Project Football right yet. The tagline is also quite uh, funny. No action, play only. Right? Just imagine Paul Chukang say that. A little bit of background of history. All right? uh, Project Football right yet is only one year old. Uh, was formed in 16 September 2015. And the idea is very simple, to bring people from different race, religion, political affliction, and background together through the game of football. Right? And I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit of the story bef uh, when it was formed. Now, remember this face. This face is his Vince. He's supposed to be here. Look at how badass is he. Right? Right? Now, like many of... Sorry, I think there's a... Uh yeah, the template is wrong. Many of great leaders go to jail and come up to become leaders or come up with great ideas. So, so does Vince. He, he was arrested and put in Jinjang for two days. 
And then after that, he comes out and he says he wants to start a football team. <laughs> so you want innovation ideas and inspiration, go to jail, right? So it was his childhood dream uh, to start a football team with many star players. And when he was uh, participating for Tangkat Najib uh, uh, rally in Sogo, he was arrested, put two days and come out and got this idea that he needs to start this before it's too late. I don't know what he means by that. The second and the third thing is to introduce an uh, innovative phase of, of, of activism. All right? Now, not many people are interested in going to rallies and protests and run away from the police and so on, especially young people. And uh, Vince and a few group of people decided that, you know what, let us be creative in promoting activism. And we decided that football is one, one of the ways to promote it and to gather people around. You see, a lot of times when you want to do activism, when you want to ask people to come for forum and things, and we have to pretty much convince people like we're selling something, like MLM like that, or asking people about AI uh, insurance and so on. But when we say, hey, come, let's play football. About time, where? It's easy, okay? Oh, he was putting, I forgot to put that on. Because I'm a, a documentary filmmaker, I also had the privilege to follow Vince around when I was in KL. Uh, and wherever he has some, some issues or press statement, I follow him around and, and record even the arrest as well. So uh, since he's not here, I have a video here which i uh, like to play. I hope that it works. Alright, the team is uh, it's made up of diverse uh, background, political afflictions and, and especially different race and, and culture. And what we try to uh, achieve here is when we present especially image like this. It's a very powerful image because it shows so much diversity in one team and able to play together, able to come together and sit together and show people that we are united. It's, it's a very powerful imagery. Now, this is not fake or compared to a lot of our uh, propaganda posters where you have models to come out and, and who knows, they're not even friends or they could be enemies standing together and taking a poster together and say, this is Malaysia. But this is real, real stuff, right? And another thing that we, we look in Project Football Riot is that football is more than football because a lot of people see football perhaps like a form of entertainment. Uh, another one, uh, like FAM, will see it, a, a football as a form of money-making and economic reasons as well. Now, for us, we, we like to see the, the symbolic representation of the field as... The football field as like a stage, a stage where it allows players to come in to dramatize and, and, and present themselves. Imagine an imagery of people coming together, score, uh, teamwork, scoring a goal, and hugging, and that is a very powerful image that we like to invoke uh, uh, to people. Besides that, it has also it has its own culture and language. One of the things that we, we, we saw when we play football together, even though the person don't know, don't know how to speak Malay that well or English that well, but we're able to communicate with each other. We know when to pass the ball to the person, we know when to uh, ask for the ball and so on. And that is a very uh, interesting culture that we see in, in pro, uh, providing football activity into this space. Second thing is the contestation of identity. Like how we, we will see that uh, J.S. Furnival will say that a marketplace where people come together in improve society where they meet, but they don't mix. But in this era of time, we believe that a football field, like a public space, allows people to come and mix. And, and that itself allows a person, especially uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Saifuddin was saying, that a form of racialization, a form where we can understand not only ourselves in terms of identity, but we understand the other people from different races. And that is an important exposure so that we can have more open-minded uh, in, in, in this country. Second thing is that we also see that there is, when we play football uh, in Project Football, right, it's a form of transformation uh, realm itself. When we enter a football field, uh, it, it's a whole di different experience. And I'm sure that most of you know who is this, right? This is Asmi Sharum. But when Asmi Sharum enters the football field, he's no longer the Malay dude from UM Teachers Law, is he? He's actually Jurgen Klinsmann. Right? He transformed himself, right? He played like Jürgen Klinsmann, he celebrated the goal of Jürgen Klinsmann, and sometimes he's, he's, he, he speaks German as well when he scores goals, right? So, and then you see that and more people, like for example, this guy, Zamir, uh, Zamir Mohammed, he's, uh, he's 
an Indian Muslim girl who has a very uh, strong opinion and, and su support of Amno as well. But when he's in a football field, he becomes Thierry Henry. He does, he's not an Indian Muslim guy anymore. It changes his identity. You go, Thierry, Thierry, Thierry Henry, come and pass to me. Right? And you have like uh, Shinji and so a lot of Ronaldos. And everybody want to become Ronaldo, see? So what we achieve in a football field is that we... We forget, we, we let go all our uh, self-centeredness of, uh, of racial identity, but adopt a very global identity altogether. And that's important in the football field, and it, it creates a certain utopian uh, concept in the football field, and that's what we see. Right? And especially with Wins himself, don't, he don't really play football, but he likes to manage well, and he returns to become Jose Mourinho. Right? You just keep this one. Uh, now, when we present this, this project, Football Right Yet, and then uh, uh, Ryan was telling me, you had to present it, well, what kind of innovative ways that you think? It's football, what, what innovation that we can talk about these things, isn't it? But, but uh, we, I had a chance to, to discuss with some of the members and say, yes, food project Football Right Yet is an innovative way uh, to, count, to bring people together. And we come up with these three Cs. Now, Project Football Right Yet is very cheap, right? You don't have to put a lot of money in this, unlike a lot of government programs to put millions of ringgit. To it. All we need is a ball and a public space, a field. Secondly, it's a very collaborative effort. Because of the diversity that we have, different types of people, it allows opportunity to understand each other, to understand each other's needs and, and uh, cultural background. And this allows us to expand our horizon in terms of understanding each other. And thirdly is... We, we believe that we need to have consistency, especially we want to, uh, in Project Football Riot, especially we want, if we want to uh, address issue of racism, it needs to be long-term. We need to have people who are able to drive this. And we are very fortunate because we have a, very, a lot of committed people. And another thing that we also need to acknowledge that we need to have leaders, young leaders who are able to lead these things and to have so much passion to drive this idea in so that people can, can move on. And, Thankfully, it got a lot of attention because when you're constantly playing, you get people's attention. Press would like to cover your news. And it, this kind of representation itself uh, represents present to us hope in Malaysia. And so several milestones that I want to talk about is that since one year, we have uh, come up with Red Card Against a Racism campaign. Uh, we also have uh, the Project Football Riot versus Against UM Law, the first year anniversary match. And finally, we also now have a Penang chapter of Project Football Riot. Yet. And that is a quite an achievement. Mm. Right? Now is a way forward. Now, it's only one year, but we have a lot of ideas or a lot of dreams that we want to achieve. Uh, first, to have more community uh, uh, outreach campaign. We have to go to more places to have friendly matches with people and from there take the opportunity to, to, to talk to them, to engage with them, to, to, to mix with them. And that's most important, like how Hannah was saying that we need to have time spent to, with people and, and to, to have the truth or, or ideas being contested and such an important thing rather than just being on ourselves. Secondly, to further extend its social media outreach and, and, we've, and, and we've, we've, we've a lot of people in, uh, in Project Football Riot. There are a lot of people who have a lot of Twitter followers. There are people who like to do photography and videography and myself and it allows a, a, a certain sense of sharing and appearing on videos and photos. And you'd be surprised that a lot of times we get a lot of people who join a, a project football right because they want to appear on a newspaper. Right? So uh, with that, thank you very much for your time. I hope you can collaborate with me uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I will have a question for you later because I, I think that sports <laughs> is one of the areas that we are free to do to to determine our own meaning and, and, and uh, 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 situation, situate ourselves in sports. And um, the way that Project Football Raya right? yeah, somehow like, wants to tell, like impose certain symbols on the sport itself. Uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss that later. Anyway, um, so next I have uh, Mr. Ryan Ong. Uh, introduced earlier as a Gender Studies and Communication student at Monash University in uh, Malaysia. Also the co-founder of Spectrum, uh, which is a queer student organization working towards social justice. So the floor is yours, Mr. Ryan. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, Pusat Commerce for giving me the opportunity to uh, running my uh, proposal. So I'm sure like, all you guys are quite tired. This is the last, um, you know, I'm the last speaker for the day. 
So I'm, I'll try to keep this short. So um, my idea for innovation towards unity is called um, the hashtag Mars campaign. So um, I consider myself a student activist. So I've been trying to run um, Spectrum, the Monash Gender and Sexuality Alliance, for over a year now. And we've been facing uh, quite a bit of difficulty because you know, it is quite a sensitive topic. And as students, we do not quite have the experience to you know, do these kind of things that are you know, quite, quite big and quite scary. So this idea is to engage the youth. So it's a comprehensive campaign uh, encompassing, encompassing university outreach, social media, and um, forums. So it builds on and uh, complements the efforts by Pusat Komas on the work such as the ICERT. Um, by that, I mean through the campaign, we are going to give information to youth on ways that they can participate uh, politically in an effective manner. So it's also going to create a platform for constructive dialogue for students. So in the university engagement, uh, we're going to collaborate with academics. So in Monash University, um, my School of Arts and Social Sciences, they have already given they had the green light that they would support this idea. And the academics in the School of Arts and Social Sciences have given their support. And um, how this is going to work is, um, they're going to help me, the universities are going to help me to have uh, forums in their university. So I'm in Sunway, so I'm going to have maybe a, a two-day talk in Monash and maybe Sunway. And uh, we're going to engage students from all, all the other universities. So we have people from UM and also UKM. So we're going to get them to also try and organize something in their, their respective universities. Um, uh, through online, we're going to have the social media campaign, which is where people are going to post their so-called Malaysian stories, where they're going to maybe take photos of friends uh, from different races and you know, give their idea of unity. But all this is going to lead to this website, because after these three months of campaigning, the website is the thing that is going to stay. The website is meant to be like a resource for youth to empower themselves with information. So a lot of it, things like extremism, um, religion, different cultures, all these people have their different ideas, but um, there's not much authority on these ideas. So this website is going to be um, a website where people can look and maybe contribute, and where um, people can get their information. So the impact will be participation, participation through social media, uh, increased awareness of the campaign, and long term, uh, the website will serve as an important resource in non-discrimination and uh, political and legal information for youth and um, other people. So the timeline, in the first month, the website will be set up, uh, event application at respective universities, social media campaign kickoff, second month, the campaign will be ongoing, several events run, and the third month, uh, possible Forum event and a wrap up. Um, I'll leave um, other questions. Um, if you guys have other questions, I will explain further. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Okay, now that we have heard from all four speakers, uh, I would like to open the floor for question and uh, for Q and A. We could start uh, with yes, Victoria. Uh, any others? Yes, yourself. One, two, three, four. Oh, one, two, three. Okay. Four. Right. Go ahead. Uh, can you please state your name and organization? It's okay. I'll just hold it up. <laughs> um, my name is Victoria. I'm from Project Dialogue. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for sharing their presentation. Um, my first question is directed at Ms. Hannah. Um, you mentioned that uh, it is not ideology that causes radicalization, but it is actually violence. And you mentioned how young boys just want the feeling of holding a gun and feeling cool. So it leads me to think, you know, lots of young boys look up to their older brothers. It's usually the seniors who recruit them. They look up to their older brothers. Oh, he's so cool. He's holding a gun. I want to feel cool too. A lot of this is a very um, 
patriarchal male narrative that's going on. Do, do you think perhaps this violence is perpetuated by a patriarchal narrative? This whole holding a gun, perpetuating violence, feeling all masculine and macho and things like that. So I don't know, it's just something we thought about at the table. Um, my second question is for Andrew. Yes. Um, Project Football, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's great. You're doing good work. However, I feel it is not groundbreaking or game-changing. I mean, uh, I don't see what's new or special about it, seeing as there's so many multiracial football teams in Malaysia. And in fact, I think it actually alienates people more, some people, because Project Football, right? Yeah, if, if you think about it from a, pers a perspective of a woman or a boy who doesn't play sports, it's, um, I mean... We, I mean, you can say, oh, we're not stopping you from joining. Please, women, boys, join sports. Everybody play football. But why is it that women and boys who don't like sports have to adjust and, and follow this idea of being strapping young sport-loving boys? Why can't the narrative try and accommodate and be more inclusive of different diverse ways of, of you know, racial unity? I don't know. There are so many different ways to do it. it, it I don't think it's very inclusive, honestly. Um, just some thoughts. And uh, Muhammad Adli from Abim, glad to meet you today. And uh, Project I was actually looking forward to work with you to help promote moderate Islam. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, can we just collect one more and then we, uh, we let the speakers answer and then we go to the third and fourth. Okay? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, um, my question is for Andrew as well, but she kind of um, said whatever Sorry, I wanted to uh, stay, say. Name? At, my name is Lina from Comas. Um, yeah, I don't exactly see how playing football is going to promote unity. Uh, firstly, because yes, a lot of people like to play football. But on the other hand, a lot of people do not like to play football. And of course, I did not uh, see um, any woman up there as well. And... Um, Yes, uh, even when we look at the national football and when Malaysia goes and plays in national teams, everybody is very excited, everybody comes together. But at the end of the day, they still go back and they go back to their old divisive narratives again. And nothing happens after the game ends. And how is this football riot going to actually expand and bring um, or even challenge the racism that is happening? because it looks more like a common interest coming together to play our sports. And um, my second question is to um, Adli. Um, of course, Abim has had his ups and downs and has been promoting uh, progressive and moderation for the past few years. But I also um, think that um, you also pick a lot of uh, safe issues and a lot of critical issues or that is uh, really, really... Uh, being a uh, challenge in Malaysia, for example, the Allah issue, uh, child marriage, uh, all these issues are not being brought up or not, uh, there is no strong statement coming out from Abim on what is your view on these issues. So what is your take on this? Um, sorry, okay. it's related um, to Victoria question. Right, sure, sorry. I'll allow it. Um, again, this is to uh, Miss Hana. Um, the four factors that you um, explained earlier, I'm just wondering if this applies to women who participate in IS as well. Because I know women play a role in um, money transaction, um, especially the cross borders type. And also women are being um, willingly married off you know, as a token to strengthen relationship between um, you know, different... Um, I don't know what you call them. Yeah, uh, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, so I would like I would let uh, Hannah answer, and then uh, Mr. Atli, and then lastly Mr. Andrew. Hi, sorry. Could I just clarify that last question? Um, I'm sorry, I don't think she stated her name, uh, but you were saying Serene. Thank you. Uh, sorry. So your question was about does that sort of circle of radicalization how it affects women or how? much that's true for women who participate but what about that part about women with financial transactions <laughs> it was um, on an article written by a think tank based in indonesia so they are saying women's playing a bigger role in money transaction 
for you know to support um, various movements in different countries. So I'm just wondering, does the four factors apply to women? Or yeah, okay. thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, I will answer the first question, which was asked by Victoria, I believe. Uh, exposure to violence and how much that has to do with a, a patriarchal society. And I think, of course, that's kind of, it goes without saying. There are so many different types of violence. Again, um, the one that we are most familiar with, of course, is physical violence, depictions of actual violence in all sorts of media. And I'm not saying that the depiction of violence in and of itself is bad, but the normalization of it is terrible because we cannot be okay with it. So, of course, you have to portray what's happening in a war zone, but not to the point where you become desensitized to it and then it just becomes okay. That it has to spark outrage for people to want to move against it. That's what happened uh, in the 70s in the US with the war in Vietnam. Because of television, people became outraged and therefore there were more strongly anti-war protests going on. But in view of how it relates to the patriarchy, I mean, the patriarchy is like a patriarchal society has so many facets to it. So what are we talking about? Exposure to violence. Um, I think it goes back to the main point, which is the normalization of it. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting issues that we tell our young boys that is no longer true when they become adults. Like, oh, you know, um, he's only bullying the girl he likes because he likes her. And then when you become older, if you do the exact same thing, it's like, oh, yeah, he's picking on his colleague at work because he's so into her. And that becomes completely unacceptable. So I completely agree. Of, of course, there, it, research has shown that there are legitimate reasons for like socializing play fights when you're young, but that's more to do with understanding your limitations, your social boundaries, what is okay, what is not okay. Because um, it's very, very academic and goes into detail. Uh, but I think the, the takeaway is, um, violence is part and parcel of life. We have to accept that it exists, but we must also be very, very strongly pro-empathy we must show lots of empathy for other people, especially people who are different from us. And of course, we must also um, make sure that people know that even though violence exists, it's something that we have to veer away from. So that would be my answer to that. Hope it answers your question. Finally, women's participation um, in, uh, I think, with, when it comes to extremism, uh, how can I put it? Organizations like Daesh basically resemble two things. First, they resemble a cult. And second, they actually resemble a small political organization because they have an ideology, they've got objective, they've got like milestone and five-year plans, and they even have a, a budget, which is not, like Al-Qaeda also has a budget, you know. Um, and where in, the, in the circle, of, in that the four points of violence, politicization, alienation, um, those don't work independently, they do work in tandem with each other. Uh, and how women become attracted to that. It's quite interesting because about 50% of women who are interested in Daesh go in because they want to be Mujahideen themselves. But then when they arrive, they're told that, uh, sorry, uh, you're a girl, you can't carry a gun. So what they do instead is, if you've seen some of the photos, propaganda photos they've propped up, um, they actually form female religious police, sort of similar to what they, I think they still have it in Saudi, um, but only to watch over the women. So that sort of satisfies some of the lust for violence there. And uh, in most cases, in any political organization, be they terrorists or even here in Malaysia, women are very actively political and they often occupy administrative roles. So it's not really far-fetched to think that um, there is a greater economic role that women play even within terrorist organizations. Uh, but I can't give you hard facts because I don't think anyone's actually done research into how many women do administration in ISIS. So, hope that answers your question. Mr. Adli? Uh, <clears throat> about patriarchal and ISIS and everything, I'm interested to, do, to explain as well. Compared to Al-Qaeda, ISIS has used this new approach on, on, on empowering women. For example, there's, and, and it's not about patriarchal narrative. If you look at the, the Twitter, this, this one Twitter called Bird of Jannah, she's a woman. And the narrative that she provides is not about male, but not war, but it's more like a woman narrative. My husband just got back from war, I treat her from her wound with this weapon. I will, you know, with all this loving romanticism of jihad or fighting on the war. So this kind of narrative do plays as well in, in ISIS, I mean, but it's a different case. Um, football, I'm so sorry, I need to respond, even though the question is not posed to me, but because we do football as well, 
uh, if I may say on behalf of the, we are here not because we are the expert and we are not providing the solution for unity, but we are doing something which we think that this might help in creating unity. And of course, for us, Abi, even though that we have about 30,000 memberships, it's not still not enough for us to mobilize the whole thing. I mean, we want to, of course, be inclusive as possible. For Abi, we provide theater, orchestra, music, so many things. But then again, that is not yet the answer. But I guess on this part, at least for those who are interested in football, at least there's one group actually doing football, and that's the name of Project Football Riot rather than anything else. And on Abim approaches on these issues, Kalima Allah in Hudu, and of course, again, uh, Hududism, 25 ringgit, do let me know if you're interested in it. It's a question of hikmah. It's the question of wisdom of how you want to approach this thing. And this, when it comes to classical interpretation of the Quran, of Islam, you have to understand that the groups that are promoting this issue or, or arguing about this issue, they, re, they, they follow this discipline of knowledge. You know, whether you like it or not, they are the expert, they know the Quran, they study so many things. It's just that their interpretation is that. And for us, we have this different interpretation. And what we want is people to really read. For example, uh, Christmas is you know, around the corner in December. So there's always this question whether a Muslim can, can uh, what call, wish Christmas, Merry Christmas or not. And this is where we comes in. We say that there's an issue of ikhtilaf, or differences of opinion. And this is where Muslims need to understand. Okay, so there's one group saying that you cannot wish, and there's another group say that you can wish. But now what we are seeking for both of them to do is to seek back and look for the knowledge. If you say can, why? Why can? So they look back in the Quran, they look at interpretations and see, this is the word or by saying, yes, we can wish Christmas. But for those who can't, I will say that we can't wish, that we ask them to go back to the Quran, go back to the classical text to support your idea saying that we cannot wish. So they have their own argument and everything. And that is okay. Because differences of opinion is rahmah. It's not about saying you're right or wrong, but we are saying that we're coming from the one source and both are right. Now it's coming on the idea of moderation for us to include this platform whereby you can see whatever you want as long as you have knowledge on this. Compared to now, like I said, the issue of sarcasm and narcissism. Of course, I'm being a lot of time that I'm being sarcastic as well. But the problem of being sarcasm and narcissism is that we, we, we reject the discipline of knowledge. And for us Muslims, even though if you like the Mufti or not, if you like the Fatwa, like it or not, but he do have some uh, legal ruling on it. So coming back to Hikmah, for us as Islamic organization, we don't want people to reject Islamic organization, Islamic institution, or India and reject Islam. But what we want is people to really understand there's a differences of opinion. You have to go back to the book, read books, and you have your own opinion, and then you, you know, will accept differences of opinion. And this is the most important thing. An issue of Hudud, for example, an issue of, sorry, in, in, to be specific, our advocacy in opening Sharia Court uh, to allow non muslim to enter Sharia Court in the issue of custody of child. We have been doing it for so many years, but it's not in press because why? Because we don't want to have the sensitive issues be discussed in the public sphere because why? public is not ready to have this kind of discussion. They will just attack, what's this, you want to open Sharia court for Islam and everything when we are, we are talking about this court and institution but rather not classical text. So while we're doing it internally, we're doing it with the Sharia court, we have Sharia lawyers here and there, advocating here and there, providing research here and there, trying to open the doors for the non-Muslims so that they can present the case of why they should have the custody of Shah. This is one of the approaches, of course, despite of having the, the, the argument of uh, jurisdiction jurisdiction between Sharia court and civil court, that one of course is still a problem, but as of now we are looking for a short solution of how we can provide justice. Because again, Islam is not about power, it's about empowering, Islam is about justice. If I say, if I tell you that we are, we would love to, to enforce Sharia in Malaysia, it's not about who do it. Sharia is about no corruption, we are talking about justice, we are talking about equality, you know, everything. And that is Sharia and that is Islam. And we, I guess, our responsibility, I've been shared by our president, we have to claim back all these terms. This is our sacred terms. Jihad and Islam and Sharia, Sharia is a sacred terms that we need to re-identify that let others know and let us read books. <laughs> let us read books, people, I guess, for all of us. Uh, and we need to find others as well. Uh, we are all here because we are in the same length of mind. You know, we are in this, but we need this lot of contestation of ideas. We need a lot of people outside of the room to be involved in this kind of discussion as well. But again, with hikmah. So we do have information, we do have knowledge, but again, and how you want to show it, it has to be in a dark manner so that people can understand. In the idea of moderation, we cannot reject people, but provide uh, pro pro platforms so that they are free to explain their ideas with knowledge. I guess that's my take on that. Thank you. 
Sorry, I just wanted to top up because I realized I forgot to answer one more question, which is about um, actually what attracts women into marriages, into the Islamic State. Um, that actually falls into politicization, which is that uh, they're baited into it. Fine, you show a picture of a hot dude, like, oh, he's so cute. But there's also this idea of satisfying marriage as a greater purpose. Um, you're marrying for the sake of the religion. You know, it's an adventure. You're sneaking behind your parents' back. There's a lot of footage of girls who actually Skype their parents and saying, oh, but I'm married for the greater good. You know, my husband's going to be a martyr, blah, 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 blah. So um, th there's a very strong component of politicization, looking for a higher purpose. And it's just that they're really good at putting this higher purpose into things that you don't anticipate. And so as he mentioned with the bird of Jannah, right, um, what... Uh, what Daesh does is they also look for people to fill in empty gaps. We need doctors, we need construction workers, we need engineers. And so there's a huge civil component in nation building which makes uh, Daesh Sa'i different from other extremist groups. And that gap is also um, largely filled by women because they basically put most of their men on the battlefield. So hashtag feminism. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, I think the question I've already addressed to the group the other day that what if someone asks you why it's all men and doesn't involve a woman and there was no answer in a WhatsApp group so here's a question I'm trying my best to answer as well uh, I guess another thing about uh, what if people not interested in football and things like that the group is after all uh, it is an interest group focusing on football in response to the uh, uh, to, to people who are interested in football in whole Malaysia and also with the craze of Ola Bola at that time during, during September 16 and they, uh, they took advantage of the frenzy and uh, to gather people around. I, I think another second thing which I uh, try to present in my presentation is that I'd like to focus more on, on, uh, on, on, on young people, Vins for example, who took the initiative to He's only a 25-year-old guy who has such vision and, and was able to start a group to, to focus, on, focus on a project that, that uh, wants to bring people with different, different background, different race together. And I thought that is something noble uh, to, uh, and also to be applauded of as well. And, and who knows, the, the, the whole idea of, of football may progress to something else. But I also like to encourage the fact that uh, such approach or starting a project that focuses on football with a noble intention to bring people together can be emulated by someone else as well. I mean, uh, the girls can also, the women can also do that. Other people can also do other interest groups in the name of bringing uh, people together and uniting people together. It can be also chess, for example. Swimming, for example. It can be so many things. Football is just one tool and one medium itself. And I hope that, as I was saying, that. We are looking forward to collab collaborate as many as uh, with as many people as possible, and we really hope that these things can be uh, can go on to become a much bigger thing, and to address the issue of of, uh, of unity and racial discrimination as well. I hope I can answer the question. If you want to speak to me personally, I'll be happy to have that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I believe Mena has a question. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, one. Okay, go. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my question is for the only person in the panel who has not answered any question yet, Ryan. Um, I think um, Malaysians Against Racism campaign sounds like a really cool idea. But my question is, um, to raise awareness and forums, I think quite a few NGOs have, have already done things like that on um, racism topics and also uh, non-discrimination. So how would your this campaign be different? What's so special about it? So that's my question. Yes, uh, this lady. Hi, my name is Naneri. I'm from Swara. Mine is more of a comment rather than a question and it's directed at Mr. Adli. So before I state this, I'd like to put out a disclaimer. I'm not saying this in my capacity as a representative from my NGO, but as a young, law graduate who wants to see some reform in this country. Number one, um, when asked the question on why does Abim not address controversial topics such as the Allah issue, I quote you, you said that 
Differences of opinion is rahma, it's wisdom. I think it's safe to assume that when the differences of opinion exist between the Muslim community. Because uh, following the whole Allah controversy, the church that I attended was burnt. So we as the Christians, we had no defense or we could not even speak up or create a attention to say, oh, look what, uh, who, look what has been done to us. You know, because we cannot just go outright and blame, but we know why it happened and what f preceded that, in, that incident. So I think to hold that differences of, of opinion is, a, is an act of wisdom. Yes, it is. But sometimes that difference <coughs> of opinion or that moderate belief should be publicized so that those of us who are from different religious groups, we would have a representative in you who hold the moderate view so that you can make it public. And the second thing is with regard to the jurisdictional, um, how to say, for the non-Muslims to have, uh, I would say, access to the Sharia courts. Well, to say that the public is not ready, I would disagree with that. Because if that was publicized as to what the steps are that Abim is taking to ensure that, it will attract controversy. And controversy attracts attention. And attention can be capitalized, and moderate views can be promoted through that. Forgive me if it was too uh, naive of uh, interpretation or information, but that's just my view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, Okay, um, I just want to ask all the panels, especially Adli from Abin. Um, <clears throat> do you think the cause of our problem now, the, the, uh, why we are having this seminar conference on non-discrimination, do you agree that this arises from uh, the attitude of the Malays, uh, uh, you know, with regards to their understanding of Islam? Um, and this has been nurtured uh, from like 20, 30 years ago, and what we see now is the result of it. So, do you agree that there's something wrong in the teaching of Islam uh, that have been uh, taught to the masses? Uh, and, uh, you know, from what I see, really, as a Malay myself, you know, I mean, I've been uh, discriminated as well as uh, persecuted by my own race purely because I don't conform to their idea of a Muslim woman. You know, this is, uh, you know, don't talk about other race. So here, I, I really see the problem is that this uh, combination of uh, politics and religion that really cause problem in this country. And I, I, I just cannot support any political group or any kind of NGOs who's trying to promote uh, uh, more religious, not, doesn't matter whether it's Islam or any other religion, being more uh, into the eyes of the public. I always say and maintain that leave religion in a private sphere. Do not actually bring it out to the public and get involved with the politics. And when once government endorses uh, any kind of religious views, it becomes problematic. Especially when the religion uh, or the, the, the dogmas that's been taught to the masses are something which uh, teach hatred towards others who are different from them. Um, do you agree that we should actually separate religion and politics uh, from uh, becoming more prominent in this country? And secondly, do you agree that we need to overhaul our education system because this is where they start breeding uh, hatred and uh, discrimination towards others who are not of the same so-called, you know, uh, Islamic uh, appearance or view? Um, these two things. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Okay, maybe uh, we get the, the responses of the, all the speakers, uh, starting from Mr. Ryan uh, to Hannah, and uh, together with your closing remarks. No okay, other um, questions? Uh, regarding the forum, 
Um, yeah, it's been done by NGOs a lot. Um, but as I mentioned, this campaign is meant to be comprehensive. So there are going to be a lot of aspects, not just forums, but um, there's going to be university engagement, um, social media campaigns, and um, also a website. So all these aspects are actually meant to complement each other, and um, it's also meant to build um, almost a kind of hype um, around the website especially, because the website is the thing that's going to be around after this uh, three-month campaign. This website is going to contain um, information that's meant to empower youth uh, with you know, uh, legal information, um, information about the political systems and the kind of things, um, social structures, power, power dynamics, power structures in society. So, yeah, um, the forum is just one small part to complement um, everything else that um, I thought of. Yeah, thanks. I guess I will echo what, what Siddhi Kasim has said, that you know, we need to consider the whole aspect of education as well. And uh, I, I, come, I come from an education background also, and looking at sometimes how, how things are being done in uh, exposing negative aspects in other uh, racial identity has a strong, uh, strong and negative impact on the future of our uh, future leaders especially. Now, we, we talk about reconciliation. We need to also talk about restoration of, of our, our real identity. And, and education itself, if we want to change the education, it's not even possible. And, and I felt that we should take advantage, as Justin Artley was saying, that we have strong support from 75% of Malaysians today, the civil society, the NGOs, and we should take advantage of that to engage with the people. I don't know how we're going to do that. We can't have several projects like what I'm doing, and, and, and each of you may also take lead in making this kind of uh, project. Education, has, let's take a look at informal education in engaging people and create certain awareness of, uh, with people so that they can, their mind can be opened up to see things differently and also to, and accept uh, different opinions. And that would be the way to go. And to, be, uh, to have a universal mind in, in, in this country, to have each of the people in, in Malaysia to have the universal mind, and I felt that that would be something that can be achievable if we have a strong strategy, which means all the civil society, all the people needs to come together and reorganize. Thank you. <clears throat> a disclaimer, Adli Zakwan speaking. Uh, I'm not talking on behalf of Islam or Nabim, but rather both Islam and Nabim influence on how I give my answer. <laughs> on the Kalima Allah, I have to admit, I'm sorry for you to expecting something from us, from Islamic organization. And I have to admit, if you Google Abim and Kalima Allah, you know what will come out, uh, our statement on that. But I would like to say that as we grow up, we need to realize and we have to admit that sometimes we do few things that might not be in line of what we thought earlier. Yep. To, for those who have not the chance to Google it, we uh, we against the idea of putting Kalima Allah in Bible at that time. Based on certain issues that we, uh, you know, certain factors that we, you know, might be in different forum that to explain. But as time goes by, we more understand and we have more interaction of the importance of it in Sabah and Sarawak, then okay, there might be a, ch a chance for us to actually have, you know, should be more lenient. But then again, I don't know whether you realize it or not. During the, at the same time, even though that we go gone against this usage of Kalimah Allah in Bible, wherever there's attack where on your church, I'm not sure whether we went there or not, but we did went to few churches and do we did do provide patrol men <laughs> to, sub, to make sure that no one will attack churches and we put a strong statement that it's not Islamic. And our fight for Islam is not for Islamic State. It's not for Negara Islam or Negara Circular, but we are looking for an Islamic concept. And when it comes to Sharia, when it comes to whatever name that you call it, we are looking at the higher purpose of Sharia, higher purpose of Islam. And that put us in a difficult position because, you know, it's easy for us to work with the non-Muslim group. And then we are, I'm saying this, the word of non-Muslim is not divisive. It's where we are coming from, but it's not where we are heading to of Muslims and non-Muslims. But then, when it comes to Muslims ourselves, uh, I'm talking on the, on the basis of strategy, strategically speaking. We have one side of those who are really extreme, 
do vocal and we do have that kind of part where we play that role as well but at the same time we also want the government to be understanding that the issues that we're bringing in is not because of politics or anything that but because we believe that this is this is this what whatever that we decide to do is an islamic thing to do and for example uh, because we are part of the muslim youth council uh, malaysia youth council of mbm which is under uh, registrar of youth and the kementerian belia dan sukan and that's the platform that we have so while we, for example, on this current issue, we support Bersih, we are part of the signatory of Bersih for free and fair election, but at the same time, we also want to keep the platform for us to be able to be a diplomat of which that we can convince the government that this change is required. So there are times where we, you, we go on the street, do demonstration whatsoever, but again, demonstration is not the only way on how you have to advocate or change things. There is a need a time for you to do a different approach of things. For example, in RUU 355, Rang Undang Undang 355, we did uh, provide an explanation on that, but that's just it. Because why? We understand that RU 355 is not an Islamic document, it's not a true, honest document, but rather has been politicized. And we don't want to get involved in politics based on that aspect. But we provide a strong statement saying that you need to make sure that you involve the non Muslim whenever it comes to any, because we believe in bottom up. We believe in, you know, rather we have been spoon fed for all these years. The government have been saying that what was and Doplo Doplo TN50 and everything, but we have our own aspiration and this is what we are the things that we want to do. I'm tired of blaming the government for everything. They haven't changed anything. But then guess what? Kalau kita tak buat siapa lagi kan? I mean, that's the channel that we have. We have to make sure that all the channels that have been given to us will be, will be you know, will be utilized full, fully. So, Based on that, I mean, of course, it's hard for myself to explain to you why we decide this on certain matters and why we decide that. It might be true, it might be wrong, I have to admit. But at that time, the reason why we make the decision, because looking at the facts and circumstances, maybe at that time we think that this is the best approach for us to do things. And again, I said, the inclusiveness is, you know, we have to admit there's always be a person who have differences of opinion on you. But we, you have, it's a fact. When you have, uh, you know, the lot of knowledge, for example, you rarely see in seminar between doctors, they have huge argument. Because both of them know that both of them are knowledgeable. And because of that knowledge, they, you can you know, debate based on knowledge rather than your emotion. And this is really important for Malays, we are really emotional. And it's hard for us to get out from that emotion. And the only way is for us to, for us to you know, Abim has always been an intellectual. It's never started from the religious group. It's always started by the professionals and intellectuals. And our vision is always make sure that the ulama will become intellectual and the intellectual will become ulama. So that you have this full understanding of knowledge of which that you can respond to contemporary issues. When it comes to Islam and politics, for us, for being non-political, and again, I would like to quote the book written by Imam al-Ghazali, by always saying that a religious person or a mufti or ulama should not involve in politics, but you need to participate of which or where that you can provide advice but not to run for office. That's always what we thought. And that's why we, myself, choose Abim. Because we are the third force, and now we are having the 75% of support. Hopefully, that we'll get, that we can keep that support. We hope that people can accept change. We hope people can really understand that Islam is not past or no. Islam is something else, and we are hope, moving towards the same direction. The issue of Makassi Sharia, we brought it in because that is the most non-controversial issues if you want to make a reform in Islam. Makasih Sharia stands for the objective of Sharia. So for example, you know, on the issues of Hudud, Hudud is part of Sharia. So when you want to enforce to make sure that there's, there's no crime, the implementation of Hudud is for you to have no crime. So if, for example, if you do have this idea which is better for you to proceed to that objective, if for example, a penal code for something and it's able to actually stop people from committing crime and everything, then that is the higher purpose of Sharia. And again, even though there's a least controversial ideology that we're trying to bring in into Malaysia, and we have a lot of discourses about that right now, people still go against it and we are okay. As long as we have this discussion with full understanding on the discipline of knowledge and we exchange views to make sure that we can uh, have a better society. Because again, from my, what I think, it's hard for us to say to the extremists that you are wrong. And again, we'll be doing the same they ask for us, the issue of takfiri, mengkafirkan. What are the use for us mengkafirkan them if they can also kafir us? We need to make sure that the doors is open and the differences of opinion we have to admit it and accept it. But again, 
in implementation in, in implementation of your ideas it has to lead to lead to something which is islamic it has to lead something that is great peaceful so for example if your argument leads something to a disastrous uh, disastrous word we have this concept in sharia which is called as sardut darai and which the concept we use when we uh, argue about the usage of is allah in kitab uh, in, in in the bible because we need to stop something bad from happening so if you for example we have these two path these two paths are correct but the one path will actually in the end will lead you you know will lead you to the same direction but it will you know a lot of issues and everything so you as a muslim you have to make sure that you have to take a better road a safer road and easier road and that is by slowly slowly making change internally in society and make sure that malay muslims understand for you become uh, for you to call yourself as muslims you have the higher responsibility of making sure that you can create a better society just like the time the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam just like what happened is islamic spain in la cavencia so this is the ideas of saifa madina and we need to make sure that people are coming you know come keep, come down read books and you know, be educated thank you oh boy okay it's a uh, very difficult to follow after the superstar of the panel um but I will endeavor to... Yeah, thanks, Adli, for giving me the hardest job. Um, I'll endeavor to answer the last three questions posed. First is, the Malay narrative uh, and the politicization of Islam, is that the reason for the sort of... the reason why we're even having this conference in the first place? Second is, should we differentiate religion and politics? And finally, um, is there a need to overhaul education? So... Uh, I will share a little bit of personal experience myself. Um, I am not a full-blooded Malay, but I have you know, been raised with the Malay culture. I can speak Malay. I got A1 for SPM, Bahasa Malaysia. But I myself have been the target of a lot of, um, I wouldn't call it bullying because I've never allowed it to stoop to that, but I've been targeted a lot by uh, especially uh, Malay men. Lah. Uh, when I was in university, um, sorry, no Malay dancing allowed. And even when I was interviewed alongside Wardina uh, about what it means to be modern and Muslim, I got bashed online for not uh, appearing like what a good Muslim Malay girl should. So with the latter, you can't do anything much about internet trolls because trolls will be trolls and they're anonymous and online. But with the former, because I actually knew who these people who tell me what I can and cannot do were, I threatened to get them all expelled. So then they let me do what I want. So um, I think there's, there's, there's something to be said, definitely, about establishment. And I think that uh, insofar as Malay society is concerned, maybe a greater, to think about it in terms of Malaysian society, there is this strong desire for all of us to conform. You know, and the idea of what conformity is is a really, really old and obsolete notion that you should be a certain way, you should behave in a certain way, you shouldn't change the status quo. So I think this conference is obviously trying to change the status quo, but within like the Malay community itself, there has to be acceptance that there are lots of different types of Malay people too. Not all Malay women want to get married at 21 and wear the tudung. I mean, I'm obviously not one of them. I'm way past 21 already. Um, and as for the tudung, my mom put it on when she was 40-something, so why can't I follow that example if I decide to go that way? So, I mean, I would agree that there is an issue with the existing narrative that we present, because we're presenting a narrative that basically says that if you don't follow us, you can take the, you know, it's our way or the highway, lah, basically. So, um, I personally refuse to bend to that, because um, A, my parents didn't raise me that way, and also because I had brothers, so you have to stand up to your brothers. But B, if I allow people to dictate my actions, then I'm not going to stand up for myself, and therefore I won't stand up for other people. So definitely change comes from within first. You have to be willing to change your own uh, cultural norms and, cultural so and your society before you can expect a larger impact on other ethnic groups. Second, religion and politics. I uh, am completely against the politicization of anything, because uh, you politicize something for the vote and when you politicize something, the issue becomes completely shallow and the only thing it results in is voting and funding. 
Um, it's the same thing with like the environmental movement when Al Gore went for it. it there's a huge influx of funding when he was done. But I mean, insofar as the activism is concerned, it's gone quiet all over again. And uh, I think religion is one of the worst things to be politicized because it's so primal and basic to your cultural identity as a person. So it's like the low hanging fruit. If you can't attract people with your constructive ideas, then you scare them with the notion that um, if you don't follow us, that means you're not who you think you are. So I think that ties in very strongly to this idea that you must conform to the status quo. Because like, instead of pushing other people away so that you can make uh, society behave in a certain way, isn't it much better to like, shelter people under an umbrella of empathy and compassion? And that's something that's severely lacking in terms of inter-ethnic relations, I feel. So yeah, no, religion shouldn't be in politics. Religion should be um, not, I wouldn't say, 100% uh, just in the private sphere necessarily because Islam is not a private sphere religion. One of the five tenets is to um, give zakat. And you can't give zakat to yourself. You have to do it in the context of a community. So I agree that Islam, religion in general, has a place in your community, but not at your political level because that is just a whole different can of worms. And then, of course, um, you know, politics simplifies stuff. Everything is made oversimplified. So you lose all the nuances of what it means to be religious as well as your own basic cultural identity. And that's dangerous. And finally, should we overhaul the education system? Hmm, very controversial question. I'm a product of the government system. I went to a SK and an SMK, uh, which surprises a lot of people. But um, I... And I have to admit, it was kind of a terrible system for anyone to go through. But I will also say that it's really built my character. So um, I agree that there's a lot of things that could be improved. I liked, because uh, I went to a school that was mostly uh, Chinese students, um, but none of us ever picked up Mandarin, which I felt was kind of like a waste, la, you know, because we can practice with each other. So um, even though the whole, you know, let's have all the bahasa in one Skola Kebangsaan kind of idea was sort of like, bang, not in the constitution, um, that was something that me and a lot of my classmates thought was uh, worthwhile, just because it would make us more enriched skills-wise, you know? So I'm not sure uh, overhauling the education system is a really simple question to answer because there's a lot of things to take into account, shortage of teachers, not enough time to teach your syllabus, trying to cram calculus into two years when people need five years to understand it. Um, so it's a lot more complicated than that. But I do agree that there should be a much stronger inter-ethnic, inter-community component to it, um, where you strongly emphasize how you relate to other people. So definitely, um, there should be more classes that unite us, like mathematics, everyone hates mathematics, you know? Um, uh, Mariam isn't everyone. But uh, there's that. There's this idea of not just uniting people against something like mathematics, but also uniting people in trying to understand something. So if you learned Mandarin, right? Um, and you also learned all the cultural nuances surrounding it, like why do they dress like they do, why do they eat where they eat, what's the romance of the three kingdoms. You not only improve appreciation for the uh, culture, but you also make something practical that you can talk about because everybody in Malaysia knows who Sitanggang is and who Sang Kanchil is. Not everybody knows who Liu Bei is, and that's a really important part of Chinese history and culture. You know? So overall hauling education, difficult. But if possible, it would be great. Um, so that would be my answer for the three questions, and I think just to sum up um, my entire presentation, I know I spoke a lot about, you know, Daesh, which is a little bit not that related to racial discrimination, but I think the foundation of the presentation that I gave is about the idea of violence in society and between communities, and A, we really need to recognize that that exists, and then we have to do something about that. And B, definitely, 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 we have to teach our kids to be kinder to each other. Because if we don't teach our kids to accept differences, even between brother and sister, how are they going to accept differences you know, with their neighbor or the person who lives on the street? So that would be my final thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. So um, of, after hearing all the speakers and the Q&A, uh, just last check. Anyone else has any last comments, last was before we go no okay so uh, I, I would like to uh, just uh, 
point out some takeaway points uh, on the ideological, political, and and somewhat sociological point of view uh, is that I find that a lot of the narrative on racism uh, involves a lot of essentializing a certain race to in order to perpetuate racism in our communities. So we essentialize a lot uh, of, 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 of Chinese people, Malay people, and, and Indian people for who they, who they are born as rather than who they are and who are they, they socialize to be. And then uh, on a political uh, level, that it has been reduced to the, the complexity of racial issues, uh, uh, racial harmony has been com reduced to a simple me versus you kind of thing. So it makes it a lot easier for politicians to give out this narrative again and again for them to stay in power. And I think we need to be uh, mindful of, of these kind of narratives uh, in order to talk about racism. And uh, lastly, I think um, uh, as a solution to this, I think any solution that we come up with, whether it be a football uh, project or, um, uh, or social media campaign or a festi uh, festival that celebrates ideas and, and different cultures, um, it's important to not essentialize other people and make it about uh, the, uh, an attack on identity the same as an attack on religion and ignoring basic human rights. So with that, I would like to thank each and every speaker here. Thank you very much. Give a hand. <laughs> and uh, I would like to close this session by giving it to Mr. Ryan.